Welcome to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, presented by Cooper Tires. My guest this episode, the great Swede, my pal Stefan Johansson. So this is actually part two of the My Racing Life and Career series that we have done with Steph. I do apologize for the long wait for this. We actually captured it in November of 2017. This is part of a uh, very memorable trip for me down to Southern California. First day I spent with Steph in his art studio, which is just a lovely, <laughs> a lovely thing where Steph does genuine art. It isn't just a studio that he's in. He is an artist. He also keeps a lot of his racing memorabilia there, photographs, helmets, and otherwise. It's the ultimate artist's man cave almost. It uh, sits high above a kind of collective work studio below and uh, is also directly behind a church. So there's lots of great stuff going on there. It's a bigger space, and I love it. Can't wait to go back and spend some more time with Steph. We did capture a part three in our series a little bit earlier this year at Sebring, so I will try to get that out here in the coming months. And then the second part of my trip, well, actually, while there, uh, about two miles away, popped around and saw my friend Oriel Servia in his brand new Poking restaurant in Santa Monica. And then the next day, I went and had lunch before flying home with my friend Dan Gurney, which uh, that was genuinely <laughs> the most memorable part because it was the last time we saw each other. So uh, I think I mentioned that before that, uh, you know, said a bit of a farewell there, not knowing that we would lose him in January. Regardless, very memorable trip. Started off with uh, this time with Steph and covered his 1984 through 1987 Formula One career the part one of the My Racing Life and Career series with Steph was really his origins coming up through the Junior Formula and his intro to Formula One uh, culminating with the end of the conversation 1983 when he was the not only race driver but kind of test dummy as well for Honda's new twin turbo Formula One V6 engine with the Spirit team. So here we jump into 1984. He definitely uh, has a, a bit of a, a collision with Ayrton Senna as the uh, Tolman team that Senna was driving for and Steph was driving for a little bit. Uh, interesting juxtaposition of their two careers. 1985, Steph signs for Scuderia Ferrari and his tale of meeting Mr. Ferrari. Uh, what the interaction was like there, signing his contract, that two-year contract, fascinating. We actually closed, so this is a podcast dedicated to a relatively short stint in Steph's career, but I would say his most memorable Formula One times, and that's closing in 1987 when he joined the McLaren team as teammate to three-time Formula One world champion Alain Prost. So it's the usual Steph, lots of character, lots of fun, great stories, and I hope you enjoy this, and I'm going to try and get part three out here soon. We need to capture a part four and five because he has done so much in his life, and uh, yeah, he is uh, by all means, uh, at least for me, the most interesting man in the world. So hopefully there will be some beer companies throwing commercial money his way. You know you can get every episode of the Marshall Pruitt Podcast on iTunes. Also on Podbean. On our Marshall Pruitt Podcast Facebook page. And even Google Play Music as well. Alright, off we go with Stefan Johansson, part two. So Steph, we, uh, when we sat down at Long Beach, we closed, we're starting to close on your 83 season. This kind of crazy developmental season with Honda coming into Formula One with uh, the minnows at, at the uh, Spirit team. Told some great stories about testing at Willow Springs of all places mm. and uh, some of the Japanese engineers being fond of winding up the boost just to see uh, uh, what would happen. Tell me about how this kind of crazy 83 uh, intro to the world of Formula One turbos ended for you and what the prospects were going into 84 because it wasn't the easiest transition it looked like. No, well, it didn't end very well for either myself or, or the Spirit team, yeah. as it were, because uh, Honda pulled the plug on, on their program, which effectively meant that you know my drive was also gone because uh, you know they went to Williams and they already had their drivers lined up, and I think they had Keke and uh, Lafitte yeah. that year. Um, so it was, you know little bit of a surprise for everybody I think and obviously left 
left all of us in a kind of a funk, you know, as far as like what, okay, what, what do we do now, you know, for 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 eighty four. Um, in my case, Honda helped me, uh, you know, arrange a uh, Formula Two drive in Japan, which was obviously, you know, not the ideal scenario by any means, you know, to take a step out of Formula sure. One and go and race F two in Japan, but. It was uh, at the time. It was really the the only option I had, you know, because uh, there was no seats available in Formula One, obviously, and uh, I wasn't really in that position anyway. To you know, to with the results we had with the Honda, was obviously you know hard hard to impress anyone because the car rarely lasted a whole distance anyway. It was fun while it well, we had good qualifying. I mean, we had some pretty strong qualifying results and stuff, but. So anyway, so that's that's what I did. I decided to do that, but in, in parallel, I also had the drive with Yost in uh, Group C still. Started with so the Porsche program, yeah. yeah. So I mean, that carried on from the year before. You know, I did the Marlboro car in '83, obviously the full season, and we won the European Championship myself and Bob Wallach. And um, I know this so. it's a little bit of a diversion from F1, and we'll we'll probably save your sports car career for a separate podcast but mm. I did want to stop quickly though in that 83 season some of the stories you tell of that Porsche uh, and the uh, power that it had the the low drag low downforce at Le Mans and such mm. I mean if you're stepping out of a uh, Honda powered Formula 1 car with a zillion horsepower but almost undrivable because of the lack of you know tuning to it what was it like stepping into what was then you know the world's most cutting edge prototype was that a easy transition going back and forth for you did you enjoy one more than the other well, I mean I enjoyed both of course I mean they were quite different back then you know because the group C cars had massive downforce back then with full tunnels and everything so they were you know and they had a lot of horsepower too, you know, so they were real beasts to drive. Obviously a lot heavier than the Formula One car, but uh, they were extremely exciting cars to drive as well. I mean, all the cars back then were exciting yeah. to drive because it was big horsepower, very little downforce in general terms, except the prototypes. And, um, you know, mostly just big tire grip, you know, so but grip level overall was obviously much, much lower than it is today. Um, so they were exciting, you know, and there was no electronics, so everything was very crude and rudimentary, you know, and and a lot more feel, I guess, was required from the driver because in some way, you know, the driver was the software, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and that, you know, so your, your sensitivity on the throttle foot was, was really critical, you know, in terms of traction and, and, and car control in general, really. It must have... Were you able to appreciate at that time, at this young stage in your career, that you were, granted I realize this wasn't Ferrari or McLaren in Formula One, but you were at least working in two series where, I mean, we at least today look back and say golden eras, just amazing golden eras. Mm. Were you feeling, were you able to appreciate that at the time? Or were you No, because that's what it was, you know, I mean, you don't realize at the time, you just just you know you you do it you know this i mean you strive to get to the top of 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 whatever you know the tree is but and the, those two categories were of course but i mean it, you had no nothing to reflect on so you know there was just that's what the cars were at the time you know and 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 that was it basically i mean it's only uh, history only allows you to to understand that you know mm. when you see how things have progressed and how things are progressing so you go from getting your first kind of finger hold on formula one to that going away you have this side opportunity which is stepping back you've already proven yourself in formula two Mm. but that's what's made available martin brundle breaks his ankle hurts his feet uh at dallas the uh the 84 dallas grand prix how does the call come, or how does the interaction come between you and Ken Tyrrell to open that door? Well, I still went to as many F1 races as I could, you mm. know, even be just because, uh, you know, I just... It's a smart thing to do. That you, you know, you you got to be on top of people's mind, you know, and I hadn't, certainly hadn't given up on the Formula 1 dream at any 
point, you know. In fact, I was called up to do that race at Sebring, you know, with 12 hours, which we won in the Yost and the Moby Dick car in 84, <laughs> which was another crazy story, but we can leave that for later be, on. That, but That's the sport, but, sports car podcast. And it was the same weekend as the first Grand Prix of the season in Brazil. And I remember, you know, having maybe done one of the best drives of my whole career, in fact. Um, you know, I felt nothing but kind of sadness that I wasn't in Brazil, you know, for the Formula One race. And it was only later on that I could really appreciate what a great day I'd had at Sebring, you know. But at the time, I was just kind of angry and a little bit bitter and just couldn't really enjoy the moment, mm. you know, of winning winning the, the Sebring race because... Every, any, the only thing that was on my mind was Formula One, you know. So I went to a lot of the races before that, and just to kind of talk to people and just being in the scene, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when the call came, you know, or when when the opportunity came, then I'm sure it had a, at least a part of it—the fact that I've, you know, been around and, you know, the, when they think of drivers to to call, then. Uh, you know the fact that I've been there in the paddock every every race almost, walking around like a spare prick. You know, but that's what you got to do. You know, so. Um, so you you go from this crazy extreme turbo Honda Spirit to I believe the only naturally aspirated car left in F1 at that time. Yeah. You know, a very analog car with a yeah. Cosworth DFY or whatever is in the back of it. Yeah. Obviously, there was uh, some legality questions at the time with the Tyrrell team. They were using the uh, the water ballast tanks. Mm. End of the season, all the results were wiped away as if they never existed. Oh, that's but right, yeah. What was it like stepping into that car? Because I have to imagine, it looked like it was a blast to drive. It wasn't as fast. But yeah, I mean, it's a very lively car. A light, small. I mean, it's tiny. Everything was so small on the car. It. Yeah, it looked like a. I dance. mean, the, there's no car. I mean, like God forbid, if you had had an accident, because <laughs> there was nothing around you to support you whatsoever. Yeah. Head sticking out a foot out of the cockpit. You know, so it was a. I mean, it was like a little go kart almost yeah. in the car. But it was. It was. It took a little bit getting used to, because um, it was just so lively and just no virtually no car straddles so the steering was extremely reactive and light on the car and um because that's just what they evolved to i guess you know with with you know over a period of time with it with this chassis but uh but it you know it was good and it was an opportunity that I, you know I, I grabbed it with both hands you know and try to do the best i can and you know and and in fact it worked out really well because i qualified Beloff, yep. which was then hailed as the sort of next messiah you know absolutely uh in my first race with him at brands hatch and i think i in fact four races i did i think i did it in all of them and i certainly out raced him so you know it all worked well and uh i think it kind of got the attention of Ferrari as well at the same time a little bit, you know, and then, uh, of course, the results were what they were, you know, but I, I just, like uh, being I mean, my only focus was to down. beat, was to beat Beloff, you know, because sure. that's the, I mean, I had a good yardstick, you know, everybody was kind of paying attention to him already. Um, but it also kind of leaves you in a situation with the lack of a turbo where you know that you can more or less win every corner. But any kind of long straight, yeah. you're just waiting to get, you know, oh, completely, yeah. truck. I mean, but the best, else. the most fun, the best, by far the best run I had was in Austria, mm. which, you know, it was like a f pure horsepower circuit. But the car was, because I love, love, and I still do, but I mean, I love fast corners, you know, when you're just balancing the car on the limit the whole time, you know, entry to exit. And I think I was actually like, Two seconds quicker than Beloff in qualifying or something. So, yeah, so it was. It was. I mean, I just loved it, you know. But we were slow. I mean, overall, we were bog slow, of course, you know. You won eight uh, like never but before. But it was still, you know, just and that's. I think that might have been one of those sort of moments where you realize that you know you can't win every battle to win the war. But it was, you know. I, it just made me realize that you got to enjoy the moment. You know, you just got to enjoy the situation you're in because you can't always have the best equipment. You can't always be in a position to win, but you can still 
do the best you can and, and feel great about it when you're done, you know. And I, that was just a great, greatest feeling, you know, because you, I mean, you're absolutely on the limit and you're barely scraping into 26th place or whatever <laughs> it was at the time. But it was, I knew that I drove that car to the absolute maximum of its performance, you know. And it was good enough for me, you know, because, and the fact that I was, more than two seconds quicker than my teammate who everybody you know and still to this day hailed us to sort of next day and send almost you know so it was good you know so looking at your early formula one career opportunism definitely stands out and i you mentioning about you know being the extra extra guy in the paddock all the time that's something that I and you and others I know preach to young drivers. Hey, if you if this is what you want to be, they've got to see you mm. if you yeah. want an opportunity. And it happens from time to time. Yeah. Senna in '84 announces premature early that he's leaving Tolman to go to Lotus. Tolman, uh, as a result, decides to stand him down, uh, and you get the call to. Uh, step into that heart-powered chassis and impressed immediately. Tell me about how that came about because, again, I, I just Well, it wasn't actually from there. Senna stepping. It was from Johnny Ciccato getting injured. I apologize. Yeah, so that's how I got to drive for the rest of the year when he got his injury, you know. Apologies. And then they stepped Senna down like two days before the Monza race and then they had actually Pierluigi Martini in his place. Mm. Uh, for that just for that one race but uh yeah same thing you know i mean so then brundle came back to Tyrrell, yeah. and then you just so happened that chicotta then got injured almost simultaneously and i had already had very good relations with the tolman guys because i drove for them in f2 and chris witty who was you yeah. know one of my sort of people who helped me very much early on in my career you know he was sort of the commercial director for tolman at the time and worked hard on Alex Horkridge, you know, to um, to make sure that, you know, I was in the frame there. And, and I knew Alex very well, obviously, from the F2 days too, you know, and, and we had some good races there, you know, with with, uh, with, the, with that car. So it kind of became almost immediately when that, then the call came, you know, to, to, to jump in there. Just, uh, Fourth, right? Fourth place in Italy. Yeah. Mons on your uh, debut with them. I mean, you'd already shown a hell of a lot of potential, but you didn't necessarily have the finishing result to hold up in the newspaper to say, yeah. see, I've told you. And I blew the start completely, you know, <laughs> and I got off the line last, I think, you know, so it was, uh, I had to drive through the entire field, basically, to, to get the foot. But yeah, it was, I mean, the, the car was really good, really good. The engine was quite impressive for you know for such a small operation Brian Hart, you got yeah i mean brian was uh, he was great i mean i love brian you know we we worked on so many different from formula two you know with the f2 engine yep. and then f1 and then after tolman with the dfvs because he prepared those as well you know and uh yeah he was a great guy um but what did you did you find yourself granted having to kind of start over again and charge from the back but was there any point where you were having any realization not necessarily during the race but you know being so close to a podium first race out with a team that was not a front running team i mean a lot of potential mm. was was that a moment for you in f1 where you said okay you know if there was any doubt before from anyone i'm showing you that i deserve an opportunity with a real real program yeah i mean the thing is you know i mean it's kind of weird because you know, look i mean in my mind and that's kind of how you have to be, I think. I was already better than all the rest of them. Of course. I mean, that, you know, so for me, it was just like I was just doing my job, you know, and I, I had zero regard for any of them because I, <laughs> that's, cause that's how you have to kind of convince yourself that you are, you know. I mean, yeah. I think it's just the psychology of, of how you have to be, you know. And everybody's like that. I mean, everybody's got a big ego, you know. If you if you want to make it big in, in, in any sport, I think, you know, you just... You don't have to show it, but that's that, that's at least how I was thinking, you know. So, so when I passed all these guys, it was just you know, 
it wasn't like, oh, yeah, I just passed, you know, whoever, you know, whatever. Sure, sure. For me, it was just the process, you know, of eliminating one opponent after the other, you know, and, and, and working working away at it, basically. Putting them in their place. Yeah, well, kind of, I suppose, yeah, in a way, yeah. yeah. So you demonstrate, again, clearly to the paddock that this kid is on a, on a path to something bigger and better. How does communication start with Ferrari for 85? Because I know that, or because I know that there was obviously, it wasn't necessarily an immediate thing, but uh, in terms of starting the season, but how did those conversations start? Are you reaching out to them? Are they reaching out to you? They reached out to me, in fact, um, after the last race at Portugal, when, you know, when Senna was third and I was running fourth, but fighting with Nicky the whole race um, it was only when I got a puncture you know he eventually got by me otherwise I mean he would have lost the championship in fact if he couldn't get by me and he was like behind me nearly the whole race uh, well till about two thirds distance I mean, when I uh, had a slow puncture but anyway um, and I guess Enzo was watching the race at Mr. Ferrari and, and uh, you know and then Marco Piccinini contacted me shortly after that and um so we had some convers just conversations, you know, more about testing in preparation for something further down the road, maybe. Yeah. So we had this dialogue going for a while, and then, of course, you know, then... But I already had a contract with Tolman then. I'd already done a contract for 85 with them. No. Uh, because they did... When we did the deal, they had an option for 85, which they then took up almost immediately when the season was over. So I had a, actually a two-year contract with mm. them, 85 and 86. But then, I don't know if you remember, they, there was all this political stuff going on with the tires. Exactly. And they, in fact, didn't have any tires for the yeah. Brazilian Grand Prix. So there I was again, without a drive, uh, <laughs> went out there on a way I'm just kind of hanging around the paddock, and Turrell decided to pull Belloff out of the car because they had some disagreement over something. So, of course, I had my kit in the bag just in yeah. case. But, I mean, this was literally like, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, 9 o'clock in the morning on Friday. Yeah. How Ken crazy. called, have you got your kit with you? I said, sure. We'll get in the car. Then he goes, what you know, it was literally had an hour before first practice. What was you Terrell know? like to deal with? Because I've, I've read he so many great. things about him. It just seemed like a real kind of, you know, uh, old school but warm character. He was fantastic. I mean, I've, I have nothing but good things to say. I mean, he for young drivers, he's probably the best team owner you could drive for because he had so much knowledge and experience and just little tricks to teach you. You know, uh, if you're, I think it was tougher for established drivers that came into the team to be lectured and told what to do all the time. But for a young and experienced guy like me, it was fantastic. You know, yeah. So, and he was funnier than I mean. Yeah. Going out to dinner at night and stuff, it was it was great. I mean, he was just a wonderful guy, you know. And and Nora, his wife, and and everybody as well, you know. So yeah, it was a good, totally different scene, of course. Then it was like just a family kind of thing, you know. And but it it was great. So had you known you were doing uh, the season eighty five season with. Tolman, the tires in place and everything, I'm sure you would have been doing uh, some testing leading up to the yeah. year? Yeah, so we or? did quite a lot of testing, in fact. We did all the testing in Brazil with a car, okay. and I, I mean, I knew, from although we had a lot of engine problems at the time, the engine would never really run properly, but I could tell that car was amazing, the Tolman. Wow. It was, I mean, Rory Byrne yeah, I know. is, in my mind, still the best I mean, maybe, you know, with Adrian New, of course, but I mean, he is One he's just heroes. a fantastic designer. A wonderful that car. Every single car that I drove of his, I mean, they got this harmony in the car that, that you just don't feel in any other car. It's just this quietness and the suspension and everything, you know, it's just, which allows you to feel the car in a much better mm -hmm. way, you know. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, the, 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 that car was incredible. So, you know, in a way, of course, you got the opportunity with Ferrari later on, but had that car run from the beginning, it would have been even better because the car was so good, and I'm sure we would have done incredibly well with that car, you know, in the season, and then that would have probably led to something even more interesting, maybe, you know. So you get, you get the call or you get the, the ask to drive the old Battle Axe 
with on an hour's notice to start the season. Yeah. You've obviously been doing some testing, so you know you've got in your fitness and whatnot. You know your neck's not going to fall off after five laps. Yeah. Thing, but in one way, I want to ask, how do you do that with essentially no notice? But I also know that a young driver like yourself would say. I get a full hour? Great. You know, I mean, I don't care. Give me two minutes notice as well, long as I have time to whole, get dressed. My I'll whole go. career was like that, you know, until then and, and many times after that as well. I mean, you know, it was kind of like thrown in the deep end, you know, and just sort of get on with it, you know, and you just deal with it and, and you know, to figure it out. You know, that's, that's what you got to do, basically. So there's the Tolman issue going on, can't get tires. You've got this one-off opportunity that comes your way with Tyrrell. There's some interesting things going on with Ferrari as well that all of a sudden, if you'd been talking about testing uh, in the past, this another opportunity comes up. How does that develop, or is this something where you're, you know, talking to Mr. Ferrari and Marinello over this? You know, how does that come about? No, I was contacted almost immediately after Brazil, in fact. Like, I think the next day or two, as soon as I got back to England, because I lived in London at the time, uh, I got a call from Marco Piccinini mm. saying that, uh, you know, or maybe it was about... It was, I would say it was less than a week before the Portuguese Grand Prix, which was the next one. Yeah. And... So it all happened very quickly, you know. He flew in t to London. We met at the Savoy, where he was staying. Nice. And literally said, you know, we want you to drive, you know. And uh, we want, just want to meet Mr. Ferrari first. But, I mean, this is the deal. This is the terms. Yada, yada, yada. Were and, the terms, uh, and again, I won't ask money, but were the terms fair? Or was it a, you're a young driver and we know you're giving you yeah, all the opportunity. more or less, yeah. I'm a young we driver. We won't charge we you it. too much. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I mean, Ferrari would never do that. But it wasn't, you know, but the money back then wasn't staggering anyway. But it was, it was, Ferrari, it was right? you know, and frankly, I, had they told me to drive for, you know, luncheon vouchers, I probably would have done that yeah. too, you know, as it were, because... I mean, it's every driver's dream to drive for Ferrari, of course, you know, and maybe even more so then than it is now, you know, because it was Enzo Ferrari who chose you to be his driver, you know. So, yeah, so then, you know, we did that, and then I have to obviously call Alex Hawkridge and give him, you know, the news and say, well, you know, this is the deal. I mean, I've been offered the Ferrari drive, you know, and they still didn't know what they were doing. They still didn't have tyres, and he said, well, I'm not... I can't hold you back, obviously, you know, if you get this opportunity, you've got to let you go, you know, and uh, and uh, so, he, you know, he was very kind, you know, and, and, and released me from their contract. And then I flew down to Maranello on, I think it was Tuesday night. Because what they had sacked, wouldn't they, they sacked Arnu, I think, yeah. Right? yeah, after the first race. Yeah, so I flew down there, landed in Bologna in the afternoon, Got picked up by Pier Paolo Gardella, the little assistant to Marco. Oh. Drove to the old factory in Modena, not the Maranello. Okay. Meet there secretly in, the, in, in Mr. Fry's old, old office there. I mean, completely, it was nothing, it was just empty basically. What the, was it like walk, I mean, I've seen photos, it's, a, it's almost oh, a mythical thing. What's I mean, it like it's totally in? surreal. Like everything with Ferrari, it's like a Fellini movie, everything, you know, I don't know why, but. Um, Hang on, let's somewhere. Can we? Hey, man. I want to interrupt you. Yeah, we're just doing an interview I here. I come back. I'll be, yeah. Um, just making a note yeah. when to edit. Yeah. So you walk into this. Yeah, so we walk through this corridor, you know, in the old, this is the old factory, it's just some old cars with blankets on top of them and stuff, you know, no lights. Just the sunlight coming through the side room is like, you know, and there's photographs of Sterling Moss, Fanjo, Farini, you know, wow. all the heroes, you know, all black and white. And like you get goosebumps, you know, just thinking about it. And then we walk into Ferrari's office and he's sitting in the back there, you know, and all you can see is kind of the silhouette, you know, and the nose and the whole nine yards, you know, and then sat down, and, you know, he's. They talk. Piero Ferrari is there, and Marco Piccinini, and then Mr. Ferrari, of course. And they're talking back and forth a little bit, you know. And then he sort of asked me, uh, "Are you hungry?" But he, Marco, then had to translate, you know. 
And I, as it were, I've been flying from London. And I was starving, but I, I kind of knew that's not what he meant, you know. So I said, I've never been more hungry in my life, you know. And, uh, and he laughed and I said, okay, you're in. Wow. Yeah. And so him, his famous uh, purple pen, which he signed everything. I mean, how, I know that obviously you're wanting to get this done, go drive, go test. Was there any sense of just, did you take a moment just for satisfaction of like, wow, this is a big step for me. This, this means something. Not at the time. And it was just like so surreal. The whole thing had happened so fast, you know. I mean, literally it was, you know, the next, I think I did like five laps at Fiorano the next day just to, you know, with Michaela's seat, which I ended up having for the race in Portugal as well. So, I mean, I had like literally blood pouring out of my shoulders at the end of the race because it was so uncomfortable, the seat, you know. Yeah, no time to do a seat fitting or anything, you know, so. So that 85 Ferrari 156, I have always thought it's one of the most beautiful yeah. Ferraris of that era. Yeah, definitely. Looked amazing. Motor was very impressive as well. What was it like getting back into a turbo car? And also, what was it like working now with a proper factory, not a garagiste who made a yeah. chassis and a motor supplied by some... What was it like being a factory driver for Formula One where you can go and talk to the men, making the engines, doing everything else? What was it like coming into that? I have to imagine, knowing your tinkering ways, you must have loved that. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously a big step, you know, in, in so many different ways, you know, to to do that and then dealing with all the just everything with being in a big team like that and then Ferrari on top of it you know with Italian media and all the other you know stuff that went on so it was I mean everything just it was like a blur almost the whole you know first early part of it you know but uh, I mean the races went well obviously you know I mean you know almost right away I mean I, I was kind of you know unlucky I know I could have won three three races on the yeah. trotte, you know, starting in Montreal, well, Imola, really, I mean, the second race I should have won, we ran out of fuel, and I'm sure had, you know, things would have changed dramatically, you know, just that first one is always the hard one, and the dynamic in the team and everything else, you know, but like always with big teams, there's an enormous amount of politics, you know, so, especially with Ferrari, and especially at that time, you know, so. Tell me a little bit about the car itself. Because this is an era in F1, 1985, 83 and 84, at least from everything that I've read, 83, 84 painted as pretty much the horsepower peak, getting into 85, it's still continuing, we get to 86, 7, 8, that's where the FIAs mm. start trying to pull power back, but what is it like, I mean, we have the, you're, you're part of one of the most iconic photos ever, of you belching you know, ungodly amounts of flame, uh, I know, uh, in Monaco, in this car. Yeah. Tell me about driving this Ferrari F-156 at Monaco, for example. What kind of power is under your right foot, and what kind of insanity is coming through your visor? Yeah, I mean, it, it was crazy, really, because, you know, there was no traction control, none of that, you know, at the time, and I mean, I think we had, I don't know what power we had in Monaco, but I know at Monza we had 1,500 horsepower, maybe even more, because <laughs> I don't think the Dyna could handle, you know, so they weren't really sure what it was, but it was a lot of power. And I mean, in qualifying, you just literally just blanked off the wastegate and whatever you got, that's what you got, you know. And I remember it was, I mean, every single gear was just wheel spin, you know, so I mean, going up the hill, the thing was just you couldn't pick the gears quick enough you just kind of had to keep your foot in it and just let it you know just go basically because if you lift and try to correct you know and the car was just back, yeah, yeah, sliding yeah. back and forth if it suddenly grabbed and grip you would just it'll just shoot you into the wall you know so you just kept it trajecting up the hill you know until you got to the top and had to jump on the brakes you know but it was it was it's like the qualifying lap was just a big blur you know we were just holding on and trying to make it point and in, in a straight line basically how mentally exhausting was that because if we're talking folks racing today obviously there are a lot of race cars that go quickly but when you have minimal weight obscene power 
And again, if we're looking at a Monaco or some other place where you're having to do a lot of fast movements, I mean, there has come a point where the brain's processing power, your eyes, your hand-eye coordination, I'm not saying you're at that limit, but I have to imagine you're getting close to the physical ability to extract the maximum. To, 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 yeah, I mean, there was, you did have to just hold on to it, you know, and do just, like I said, I mean, normally you, you're able to process everything pretty well, you know, and everything is, even though it happens, it kind of feels like it's in slow motion, mostly, because, you know, so you still have time to control everything. I don't know how the brain everything. does that, but it's amazing when yeah, it does that. Yeah, yeah. And that's when you know you're on top of it, you know, when you feel like you're sort of walking on the pavement, really, you know, it's not, not an effort, really, you just, everything is just flowing and it's processing everything in a very kind of <laughs> quiet way, but, uh, you know, you don't want to feel like your car is driving you, you know, you, go, you, you want to feel like you're driving the car. And, of course, in a situation like that, it was definitely creeping into the territory where the car was driving you, you know, more than the other way around, but... Uh, but I think everybody had the same. I mean, it was just, you know, with with that amount of horsepower, you know. So this '85 season, you grab your first podiums, your first two podiums of mm. Canada and Detroit back to back, I believe. Yeah. We've already kind of picked up that you weren't a big sense of accomplishment guy at the time. But was there any like, cool? I'm spraying champagne. Aha! This is the place I've known I should be, and here I am. Well, I mean, yeah, but I was disappointed both races because did Montreal. I had team orders, you know, to stay behind Mikhail. Otherwise, I would have for a hundred percent won the race. I mean, I was way faster, you know. So I was just backing off basically when I caught him, you know, by a second a lap, and then I just had to sit there and wait, basically. Which at the time, you know, it was my third race for the team. You feel, oh, well, there'd be plenty more opportunities, you know, that whatever. He was already established in the team, and I didn't want to rock the boat and whatever. But as it were, you know, I mean, I think in retrospect, you maybe just should obviously go for every win you can, you know. Um, and then uh, Detroit, the brake rotor blew up with a lap to go when, you know, same thing, Keke had huge problems with the cooling, and he really couldn't, he couldn't have res put up a, a defense, you know. So again, had a you know I had no brakes basically the last two laps. I just had to crawl around to you know to even make it around the corners. You know otherwise it would have been an easy win there as well. And um, Nurburgring the same later in the year. So I think I could have won four races pretty comfortably that year, as it were. But you know if of course you know it's always the ifs and the buts <laughs> and all the rest of it. You know but so coming out of '85. This was, I was, I mean, granted, I'd followed Formula One for a number of years by then, but this is really 83, 4, 5 is where I was really starting to pay, you know, more, a lot more attention. I remember you coming out of 85, didn't have that win that you wanted, and again, you should have had on multiple occasions, but there was a definite feeling of, all right, you know, there there is a definite badass that's been established here. Mm -hmm. You step out of this beautiful gorgeous 85 chassis into one of the ugliest dog dick yeah. machines i've ever seen the, the ferrari f186 as an artist i'm guessing when you saw the wraps come off of it you said fuck me seriously yeah i'll never forget it actually the day because michael and i we both came down you know we were they asked us to come down to the factory to see the new car and everything and we'd never even I mean back then we hadn't even seen like any drawings or anything of the car you know it's just everybody was just working away and then we, we we you know they took us into the room there and we both looked at each other and like oh my god <laughs> this is going to be a long season <laughs> <laughs> it looked like they carved out a whale well, or something we were both it. like what the fuck have <laughs> <I been?" laughs> <laughs> and it certainly turned out to be that way. I mean, it was a but tough you, you, car. I mean, it just, was more towards no. the end of the year. But you, I mean, yeah. Uh, you, how's this? You're able. You're still able to get a number of podiums that year. And I'm sure you know all your career stats. But this is one that I, I looked up and I just found it's very telling when you had, I believe, 79, 80 Formula One starts or so. You had 12 podiums. Hmm. I mean, you look at those numbers. Yeah. 
And you go, well, and you also factor in that of those 79 or 80, we're talking the fucking spirit. We're mm. talking you're the only guy driving the yeah. non-turbo, tur you know, in a year of turbos. You've got this 86 car that was going nowhere quickly. There were some later in your career we'll get to. But, you know, if there was a chance, you know, you were headed towards the podium, how much effort did it take to do that in 86? Because that car never looked like it was going to try and help you to get there. Well, so, no, I mean, I kind of had to change my whole attitude to, again, obviously the focus, if you can't win, at least you've got to beat your teammate, you know. Mm. So my focus was always on race, race setup. You know, I didn't really even bother with qualifying because I, I knew that, you know, you, if you can get the race set up as good as you can, you can always make something happen, you know, just by trying to be a bit clever on strategy and, you know, tire choice and things like that. So I'd put a lot of emphasis on that all the time. And I always had a good dialogue with the Goodyear guys at the mm. time, you know, and because and, I figured, you know, I mean, like, same as now, and you know. Uh, tires, you know, tires, engine, chassis, I mean, they're all equally important at the end of the day, you know, to get get the results. So I, I put a lot of emphasis on the tires and making sure that I could do full race distance without having to stop, you know, and, yeah. and try to use as soft a compound as I could, because we had three compounds to choose, choose from each time. And this is an era and, which uh, I should have mentioned, uh, although refueling has been common for, you know, two decades now or however long uh, that was not uh, a part of the uh, not a part of the program then so you did absolutely have to uh, you know other than stops for tires uh, yeah you know you had to make and make a car work from loaded with petrol to absolutely empty yeah so what I did every pretty much every weekend we we kind of came up with this strategy to do take the, the C's which were the softer ones and give them a heat cycle every day so we did a short run on friday and let them sit overnight did like a three lap run or something you know and then the same thing on saturday let them sit and that became the race set because nice. they just cured a yeah, little yeah, bit yeah. just enough to because we had back then it was always a problem with blistering and it most of the time it, it worked and in fact i would have won the mexican grand prix had we not had a slow puncture so I had to start with a with a fresh set on the left front or the right front, I can't remember. But anyway, that ended up blistering. So Berger ended up winning. Otherwise, I would have won that race as well, for sure. But, uh, but anyway, so the focus was always on trying to get the best possible job done and, you know, really just ignore qualifying and just focus on a really good race setup, you know. That, and, and it worked most of the time because I certainly outraced Michaela pretty comfortably that year, you know. Um, so you or, get get to the end of 86 and where do things go discussions contractually with Ferrari because obviously uh, you drove for McLaren the following year but I mean where in 86 did talks about either continuing or not I mean where does that enter the conversation well it started sort of you know frustration level was pretty high at that point you know and McLaren was the sort of the, the winning team, the dominant team at the time, you know, and then Ron, I knew Ron quite well from Formula 3, you know, won the Formula 3 championship in 1980 with Project yeah. 4, and I had really good relationships with a lot of people at McLaren from, A, from the Project 4 days and just, you know, knowing a lot of the engineers and designers there and everything from before, you know, Alan Jenkins and uh, Steve Nichols and all those guys, you know. One thing that I... Again, we see this in hindsight, and it's also something that I'm sure you coach your young driver clients to do, but your guy who's always maintained relationships. Mm -hmm. A, you know everybody, but most of all, you don't just know them, but you actually cultivate and maintain relationships, not from a to use people, but just, you know, that's always been, I think, one of the keys to your career being so diverse, but also so long. Mm. You're not someone, if something goes wrong and you're out of a drive, you're sitting there wondering what to do and who to call. No, mm -hmm. you have 20 people you can call who yeah. are invested in what you're doing. So with things at Ferrari being not as pleasant as you would want by the end of 86, do you ring Ron? Does he ring you? I mean, that team at the time, champion, 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 pros. Well, we knew each other anyway. In fact, we still went on, I mean, I remember 
86 after Montreal, I think it was, we actually went on vacation together for a few days because in between two races, I think between Detroit and Montreal or something. Um, so we were hanging out just kind of socially, you know, and uh, so it kind of just kind of evolved mm. organically almost, you know. And then when Keke, I think he announced his retirement yeah. around the same time. So, so we had conversations going on quite early on, you know, and, um, you know, then, of course, Ron, at the same time, was trying hard to get Senna, but that didn't work out, so it took a while to get to seal the deal, but, you know, I figured at the time it was the best opportunity for me, although I knew it could only mean one year, possibly, you know, if uh, if Senna was in the, in the pipeline, which, of course, he was. Um, so that's that's what ended up happening anyway. So you had handled your teammates pretty much everywhere up to this point fairly easily. What did you find in working with your new teammate, reigning world champion Alan Probst? Was he welcoming to you? And what did what kind of bond or rapport did, did you guys or do you guys not establish? No, he was he was very good in fact I mean it's very welcoming very you know very good in every way I would say except that he was so damn good <laughs> compared to any other teammate I'd had it was like another I mean literally another world you know it was I'd say I've learned more in that year being his teammate about how to being a professional driver I guess you know mm. than, than I've learned in my whole career pretty much he was just on a whole different level to everybody else in, in just the way in, he operated in, around the car, you know, how he managed the car, the setup, and how, I mean, the first couple of races, I mean, my brain was just fried trying to keep up with the debriefs, you know, and just the amount of information that came out of him. But then, I, you know, you sort of learn and you listen and you try to, you know, you know kind of follow what's going on there. And you could tell there was a certain, you know, he'd, he'd broken it down into, a, you know, they call him the professor for a reason. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it's been something that's been helpful ever since. And, and I'm, well, I know this for a fact that, you know, Senna, before he became Pro's teammate, wasn't even close to the driver he ended up being. Because mm. he'd learned the same process. Because I was teammates with Senna, I remember, in Tolman. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you have a certain way, method of, let's say, operating around the car and the way you do the debriefs and the setup. And, you know, you talk to your engineers and, but, Prost was on a completely different level to every, all the rest of us, every, everyone in the in the field, I would say, without a doubt. Because I knew the other drivers. I mean, I knew sure. Nelson quite well, you know, and Nigel and, 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 and a lot of the other guys, you know. Um, and he was, well, I mean, it's like almost like, it's interesting because he, he operated like, I mean, he's the CEO of the car, basically. If you give it an, an analogy That's a great way and it. he has this whole team of people around him that he just he just works everybody and try to extract the best out of everybody and you know work it so that everybody's working for him he's the boss of the car and everybody's kind of his team around him you know How so it's just like you're the boss of the company and you know you 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 direct everybody and okay you need to do that you move that you know it, it was, it's fantastic really you know it's a brilliant how would you have described yourself in that analogy then before you came to McLean? Well, it was more of a feel thing, you know, okay. just you, you work more on feel and impulse and just, you know, you, 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 you try to break down what the car is doing, obviously, but in a different way, you know, not, not being so much, let's say, in charge of the car. Mm. Like you, 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 you told them what the car was doing and then you let them basically get on with trying to fix it you know do the, yeah so. but whereas here it was more like you know it was a completely integrated in that whole process you know and so this was a the mp43 chassis that had been fairly well developed you know coming in to the 87 season power had been pulled back a little bit but that car while it it never struck me as the best very difficult car to drive it's probably one of the I, would, I mean, Prost would certainly vouch for that too. It's probably, I mean, for him, it was probably the worst car up until then. Mm. McLaren, well, because I mean, before they've always had you know winning cars. Understood. Uh, 
So it was a very nervous car, you know, very, very, very small window to to get into the op- the really good operating window, you know, and very just very nervous, very very sensitive car on entry, you know. So it was very difficult to commit, you know, and and not over commit. So it's had a very fine balance there of you know being on the right space. Let's say either you, you're not quite pushing quite hard enough, or if you push a little bit harder, you go right over the limit, you know, and then you lose either you spin or you lose more time trying to catch it, you know. So it was a very tough car to to extract the most out of. And then we had a lot of engine issues that year as well. It was last year of the Tag Heuer engine, you know, and it was uh, had a lot of just niggling little mechanical issues a lot of turbo issues and just generally you know not not uh, not a very uh, not a lot of continuity let's say in mm. the in the development of that almost like that chassis that engine which had had again world champion success with Nikki and Alan mm. seemed like that it was definitely at the end of its development life, if not a little bit past, I mean, we saw the following year in '88 with the MP44, yeah. just you know, yeah. Gordon Murray at his, at his best. But it definitely seemed like they were trying to get one more year out of a car that mm. you know, maybe I don't know if it had a year to give. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, it was definitely that sort of a that final transition, and I think a lot, a lot of the other teams progressed. A lot more that year, let's say, you know, and uh, and it was difficult, extra difficult for me because I hardly did any testing the whole year. I mean, I did like I think a total of thirty laps in the car the whole season. Jeez. That was it. Yeah, I mean, no. So it was, you know, you arrive at all these tracks and you try to commit in qualifying, and then you have Prost as your teammate on top of it, you know. So <laughs> I mean, it makes it even more difficult, of course. But so in retrospect, I don't think I did too bad because I think I finished fifteen points behind him in the yeah. championship. I mean, you he was fourth and I was sixth. So, lots, you know, almost a handful of podiums. As yeah. Well. So if you, you know, it, but of course, you know, six doesn't mean anything in the bigger picture. But if you, if you if you look at it from that point of view, you know, I think I certainly did as well as could be, you know, possible in the in the circumstances. And that was our pal Stefan Johansson, part two of the My Racing Life and Career series. So we'll definitely, again, try and get the other parts up and running here before too long. If you get a chance, would definitely appreciate if you check out our Marshall Pruitt YouTube page. Trying to build a subscriber base there. Have some new videos that are going to be going up. Some old videos that are going to be going up. Uh, found a whole stash of uh, content I'd forgotten about that I created back at Le Mans in 2008 so 10 years ago and since i'm gonna have to miss this year's event figure i'll wheel out uh freshen up and then wheel out some uh some of that content from about 10 years ago but again if you get a chance if you happen to be in youtube land if you can check out my little page there the marshall pruitt page on youtube and subscribe that would be awesome all right time for me to say my name more than once and in a weird way i'm marshall pruitt This is a Marshall Pruitt podcast presented by Cooper Tires. Thank you for listening.